All right. Well, well uh, tonight uh, we're going to be walking through Second uh, Samuel 22 through 24. We're going to be finishing it up. Uh, and then next week we are off and we'll come back in, in November and we're hitting into First Kings. And so tonight, uh, wrapping Second Samuel, uh, we are not ending the life of David because First Kings, there's some David talking to Solomon stuff that's going to continue happening. Um, but here we are going to get uh, the, the writer of Samuel is going to capture David's last words, and then David's going to go talk some more. So that's one more reason uh, why last week talked about how these last sections aren't necessarily chronologically ordered. They're kind of stories that are included here um, and to kind of sum up David's uh, leadership. Uh, and the first section here that we're going to look at is uh, a psalm. And the psalm is also... Uh, basically word for word, Psalm 18. Um, and so this is a song of victory for uh, David um, and kind of, and looking at how God has provided and protected, uh, uh, provide, provided for him and protected him and his household. Uh, and so as we read through this, there's going to be things that you're you will have said, I've, I've heard that before. And it's because it's also Psalm 18. So um, even if you've never read 2 Samuel, you've heard this before. So uh, let's just jump in there. Um, yeah, let's just jump forward. Okay, I'm going to kind of chunk it down into different sections. And so I'm going to read uh, for, through verse seven. David, David sang to the Lord the words of this song when the Lord delivered him from the hands of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge, and my savior. From violent people, you save me. I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise and have been saved from my enemies. The waves of death swirled about me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called out to the Lord. I called out to my God. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came to his ears. So in the introduction to this psalm, uh, talking about how the Lord delivered him from his enemies and from the hands of Saul, that's one of the, one of the placements of when did David actually write this psalm? Uh, not necessarily at the end of his life or later. It could have been earlier, maybe right when he became king. Um, and because hey michael uh because this song has a lot of uh, it's a big song so it could have been something that he worked on throughout his life so it doesn't necessarily mean that he just sat down and wrote it all at one time he could have been developing it over time um and for uh the tradition of like victory songs is something that i mean we still uh have victory songs even now uh, songs like Yankee Doodle Dandy, uh, you know, like that's a Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony. Anyway, um, the, <laughs> we have these songs uh, that uh, that highlight victory or um, maybe not even a victory so much as endurance. Like the Star Spangled Banner is a, uh, a song of how, you know, the fort survived overnight, basically. Um, and, you know, that like those kinds of songs are traditionally a part of the national identity and here we have one of those elements as well that david as the king uh we're going to see that he has a national identity uh wrapped up in how god has protected him and his house and knowing that david uh the significance for the house the people of israel is that david's uh monarchy and his descendants are the chosen family that god chose and so how God protected David's family trickles down uh, to God's protection for the faithful in, among Israel as well. And so uh, David almost has like a George Washington-esque uh, significance uh, for the people of Israel, like founder first, he's not the founder of Israel, but like the first good king and heavy quotes on good. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he's a mess, but compared to Saul, who, more faithful anyway uh david's a mess we we can agree with this 
part of this as well it, that we see there's a lot of metaphors and one of the metaphors is the waves of death um and so in those moments of uh overwhelming forces coming against him it like that like wave of death that like I, if I don't know how to handle this wave, it could kill me. And if we've ever been in the ocean, um, like I, I don't like swimming in the ocean because I know how powerful it is. Uh, and so, um, you know, and so like, Michael, you, you surf, uh, but you know what to do, you know? Yeah. Uh, and it's nice to get out and like know how to work the waves, right? But if you don't know, it can be very dangerous. And so that imagery for David talking about like, this is overwhelming. I like if I don't if I'm not careful, I could be crushed. Um, and his only real rescue in these these situations is the Lord, who is his rock that he is his foundation, but also his shield protecting him. And so he's kind of mixing all of his metaphors here. One of the echoes in this psalm that I find interesting as as well is the um, the waves of that verse five through seven um this sounds a lot like jonah's prayer in jonah chapter two and and so there's an echo there uh for for jonah as he's going he's saying that prayer uh in the belly of the great fish and being told, pulled down into the abyss and he calls out to the lord in his temple um and so there is a a similarity here um in and revealing God's faithfulness uh, in hearing the cr the cries of His people. Um, <clears throat> let's keep going through eight, uh, eight through sixteen. The earth trembled and quaked. The foundations of the heavens shook. They trembled because He, the Lord, was angry. Smoke rose from His nostrils. Consuming fire came from His mouth. Burning coals blazed out of it. He parted the heavens and came down. Dark clouds were under his feet. He mounted the cherubim and flew. He soared on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his canopy around him in the dark rain clouds of the sky. Out of the brightness of his presence, bolts of lightning blazed forth. The Lord thundered from heaven. The voice of the Most High resounded. He shot his arrows and scattered the enemy. With great bolts of lightning, he routed them. The valleys of the sea were exposed and the foundations of the earth laid bare at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of breath from his nostrils. And so as David calls out, the Lord responds. And so here we see God in uh, revealed in power of creation. The earth shakes, the thunder, the lightning, the, the torrents, all of these things uh, are displays of God's power and and mastery over creation itself um and there are instances where david could have seen like you know miraculous rain that made it difficult for his enemies to fight against him or an earthquake uh that was at just the right time uh that could have been um protection from from god and so recognize david recognizing that the lord is not limited to the weapons of war of humanity uh, but that he can use all of creation to do what he wants to do. Um, there's also a contrast with the Lord Yahweh um, and the the gods of the Canaanites to keep in mind as well, because Baal, who you know is um, the the often depicted with thunder and lightning uh, and rain, because he's a part of the harvest. Uh, uh, pantheon of do of gods that are looking at uh, care for the harvest and so here david is saying it's not baal who helps people it, it's it's the lord yahweh um and so sometimes when we read through these psalms we should also be thinking through like who else could try to make these claims about this kind of power um and as you know followers of jesus readers of the the hebrew scriptures and the and the new testament to be able to say like it's all pointing back to Yahweh, not to a pantheon of small gods, but the Lord himself. Um, so let's uh, uh, turn to 17. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out in a spacious place 
He rescued me because he delighted in me. The Lord has dealt with me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He has rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord. I am not guilty of turning from my God. All his laws are before me. I have not turned away from his decrees. I have been blameless before him and have kept myself from sin. The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness in his sight. Uh, inside's fine. Um, it's all good. So the... Um, Part of this psalm, as we are looking at uh, verse 20, I want to highlight, I'm, I'm not going to be able to hit every image in here, but from the claustrophobia of being dragged underwater to being brought out into a spacious place. So that's that's one of the contrasts that David is saying, like, my enemies were coming against me, but the Lord pulled me up and gave me a wide open space. Hey. Uh, okay, we'll do questions. One, the, the slingshot with David and Goliath. Yes. King David is the same one. Yes. Like, All right. Like yes. Yeah. All right. So, Linda, we'll do questions at the end if you have more. Uh, you know, my caregiver likes to go to bed at eight and then they lock the door. Okay. Well, I'll try to get as close as possible. So, all right. Um, so the, uh, so yeah, so there's the, from the claustrophobia to the wide open space that the Lord provides. Um, so this is one of the ways that God rescues David. The other piece in here that we read through and we go, huh, is David's claims of sinlessness. And we have walked through the life of David. We know this is not the case. And so part of the, like his, his claim to be able to say, I'm following the Lord's path is not, we can't say that David was perfect and without sin, but the contrast between David and Saul, again, coming back to when David was confronted with his sin, he repented. And even though he was, he did awful things with Bathsheba um, and, and Uriah, like those are terrible things, but he was still willing to recognize his brokenness and turn on the right path and and to keep trying to follow the lord and so this is a um yeah this is one of those psalms the sections of the psalms where you're like david i don't think you have an accurate representation of yourself but we also need to recognize like you know he's he's trying uh in a way that saul wasn't <laughs> saul saul quickly abandoned trying to follow after the lord so uh, let's jump to verse 26. Uh, and this is probably some of the most, um, I think, important parts of this. To the faithful, you show yourself faithful. To the blameless, you show yourself blameless. To the pure, you show yourself pure. But to the devious, you show yourself shrewd. You save the humble, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them low. You, Lord, are my lamp. The Lord turns my darkness into light. With your help, I can advance against a troop. With my God, I can scale a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. He who is God, for who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? Is it, it is the God who arms me. It is God who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer he causes me to stand on the heights. He trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. You make your, uh, you make your saving help my shield. Your help has made me great. You provide a broad path for my feet so that my ankles do not give way. Uh, and so here, this to the faithful, you're faithful. To the blameless, you're blameless. To the pure, you're, you're pure. But those who are devious, you show yourself shrewd. And so this idea of those who are like scheming and trying to get their own way, God's like, I'm going to circumvent your way. That's what like the shrewdness is. Like he's, he sees their tricks. Um, and, but the faithful, you show yourself faithful. The blameless, you show yourself blameless. Now, the only way that we can truly be faithful uh, and blameless is to be surrendered to the Lord. And that's part of our, um, part of what the Lord I, part of what David is trying to communicate here um, is that 
God does this transformation work in us. And he, he's the one who rescues. He's the one who guides and directs. Um, also, a, another image here is the he makes my feet like the feet of a deer. Uh, and that is um, comes up again in one of in the one of the prophets. Oh, man. And I am spacing on which of the prophets it is. It's one of the minor prophets. It's later Habakkuk. Uh, it, it says in the uh, end of Habakkuk. The final uh, song and prayer, uh, it says, you have made my feet uh, like almost exactly the same words here. Um, in the last verse, 19, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. And so um, Habakkuk is written much later than David's lifetime. And so this psalm uh, was probably well circulated by this time. And so David, David's words are echoed in the words of Habakkuk later. Um, and so, but that image of like, if you've seen mountain goats, like climbing up the side of a cliff, it's like that kind of uh, work that the Lord is making possible. But for the, the goat, that doesn't look impossible. Um, and so even in this thing, you provide a broad path for my feet. For the goat is like, this is just the way you go. Um, and for us, it's like, I can't do it. And so when we're following the Lord, he's saying like, no, I'll show you the way you go. I was uh, watching um, the the marathon baseball game on Saturday. Um, and one of the commentators said, the ball looks big to him lately about one of the batters. Yeah. Because like that, like if you ever tried to hit a ball flying at you at a hundred miles an hour, that ball is small and fast. And it, when you're like in the, like, trained to be able to see it like it looks bigger like you have a perspective of it that's different than our perspective um and so that's kind of what the the lord is doing for david is like the path is broad as he's trusting him because he's uh he's the the light and the the guidance that he needs on what would seem difficult for everybody else um verse 38 <clears throat> 38. I pursued my enemies and crushed them. I did not turn back till they were destroyed. I crushed them completely and they could not rise. They fell beneath my feet. You armed me with strength for battle. You humbled my adversaries before me. You made my enemies turn their backs in flight and I destroyed my foes. They cried for help, but there was no one to save them to the Lord, but he did not answer. I beat them as fine as the dust of the earth. I pounded and trampled them like mud in the streets. And so David is He's, as we've seen, he's proven to be victorious over all of his enemies over and over again. Um, and he's giving credit to what the Lord, the Lord giving him the strength to do these, uh, to, to defeat his enemies in this way. Uh, verse 44, you have delivered me from the attacks of the peoples. You have preserved me as the head of nations. People I did not know now serve me. Foreigners cower before me. As soon as they hear of me, they obey me, all, they all lose heart. They come trembling from their strongholds. The Lord lives. Praise be to my rock. Exalted be my God, the God, my Savior, the rock, my Savior. He is the God who avenges me. He puts the nations under me, who sets me free from my enemies. You exalted me above my foes. From a violent man, you rescued me. Therefore, I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing the praises of your name. He gives his king great victories. He shows unfailing kindness to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. Um, yeah, so again, pointing to the Lord's saving work, but part of the nation of Israel, um, going all the way back to Abraham, through you, all nations will be blessed. So the nation of Israel was intended not just to be an insular little nation but to be an influence throughout the region and the world and for david's time being the influence throughout the world was partly possible because of conquest and uh, the the victories that they were having over their their neighbors um and so we saw that there were different uh, neighbors that were giving starting to give david tribute uh so like uh, basically a tax to David because they wanted to be on his good graces. 
Um, and so that's part of what he's talking about here is like, Lord, you have made these nations pay attention to us and submit to us. Um, and so ultimately, though, that tribute and conquest are not the best ways to lead people into a loving relationship with the Lord. Uh, so um, that's not God's ultimate plan. Um, and so when we read through these things, it's like, and we look to apply this to today, it should not be, well, yeah, let's go get some armies and let's go spread the gospel with missiles. That's, that's not how we should read that or apply that today. Um, so, yeah, so this Psalm, it's uh, repeated in, in Psalm 18. Um, yeah, so let's look at David's last words, which again are not his last, last words, but their last words here. Uh, and that's in chapter 23. These are the last words of David, the inspired utterance of David, son of Jesse, the utterance of the man exalted by the Most High, the man anointed by the God of Jacob, the hero of Israel's songs. Um, and so this, the, here saying the inspired utterance, it is a, uh, that's, the, that's the kind of language that we use of prophets. Um, and so David is a king, but he's also in this situation working in the prophetic uh, role. So uh, the spirit of the Lord spoke, spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. The God of Israel spoke. The rock of Israel said to me, when one rules over people in righteousness, when he rules in the fear of God, he is like the light of morning at sunrise on a cloudless morning. The light, like the brightness after rain that brings grass from the earth. If my house were not right with God, surely he would not have made with me an everlasting covenant, arranged and secured in every part. Surely he would not bring to my fruition my salvation and grant me my every desire. But evil men are all to be cast aside like thorns, which are not gathered with the hand. Whoever touches thorns uses a tool of iron or the shaft of a spear. They are burned up where they lie. So this last word, these last words, this prophetic utterance is David saying, um, God has called me and my family, and he has called us not because of, uh, because of he, his view of our faultlessness. Like God chose them, even though they're imperfect, because they are chosen, God has given them this, this faultlessness, if that makes sense. Um, and uh, if these were David's last, 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 very last words right before he died, that's impressive um, because that's some well thought out things um, uh, to say right before you die. Uh, but the the message, though, is like, hey, we as it is as, as a warning to next generation as well. We need to follow the Lord. We need to not follow after the path of the wicked. Because the path of the wicked are like thorns. And part of the message here is don't even touch them. Don't gather thorns with your bare hands. You're going to get hurt. And so this is a, a bit of a commissioning and saying like, Lord, the Lord has called us. Let's be faithful to him. And so don't just assume that everything's going to go great. Yeah, he gave us this, um, this everlasting covenant that you know, there will be a descendant to rule over the God's people forever, but let's still not just go around grabbing thorns with our bare hands. So, and if you've ever done that, you know how painful it is. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so the faithfulness of God is going to be revealed in, um, in, in their own lives as they are faithful to the Lord. And we'll, we're going to see prophets rising rising up to speak against the descendants of David when they veer off track and the prophets will, will come and call them back to covenant faithfulness. Um, all right. Now the next section is uh, a list of David's mighty warriors. Um, and we're going to look at these in a few sections at a time. Uh, so we'll start with verse eight and go through verse 17. These are the names of David's mighty warriors. Yoshev Bashabeth, a, a Tachmenite, was chief of the three. He raised his spear against 800 men whom he killed in one encounter. Next to him was Eliezer, son of Dodai, the Ahoite. As one of the three uh, mighty warriors, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines gathered in Pastamim, 
for battle. Then the Israelites retreated, but Eliezer stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. The troops returned to Eliezer, but only to strip the dead. Next to him was Shammah, son of Agi, the Hararite. When the Philistines banded together at a place where they, there was a field full of lentils, Israel's troops fled from them. But Shammah took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck the Philistines down, and the Lord brought about a great victory. During harvest time, three of his 30 chief warriors came down to David at the cave of Adullam, while a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Raphaim. At that time, David was in the stronghold, and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water and said, Oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. So the three mighty warriors broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, and carried it back to David, but he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it on the, uh, out before the Lord. Far be it from me, Lord, to do this. He said, is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives? And David would not drink it. Such were the exploits of the three mighty warriors. So uh, these three dudes, uh, Josheb, ba Bashabeth, Eliezer, and Shammah all um, were in the uh, hierarchy. There was probably, there's Joab was the, the chief, but these three were then like sub chief, uh, like sub commanders under Joab. And each of them, like we see like this impressive victory over uh, the enemies of the Philistines and are the, the Philistines. They um, kill hundreds of people, hundreds of enemies by themselves. In, and then the first one with one encounter. So it's not like he was run, keeping a running tally over all the battles. It was like, no, just this one time. This uh, Joseph ba Bashabeth did, did all of that. The only way this is possible and why this is here is because the Lord enabled these men to fight with great power and strength against the Philistines. Um, and so that's part of the reason why these are included in this section is like, look at what the Lord did through these three men. Um, and even when the other members of the army wanted to run away, these three were bold and courageous. And so as we're looking at David's songs of victory, and then we're reading his last words, be faithful to the Lord. Then we start looking at these mighty men and recognizing this is what God can do through the faithful, through those who are are willing to uh, trust God for the victory. So part of that then, these three, they're with David, and David's like, man, I'm super thirsty. The best water in the world is from the, the well at Bethlehem. But the Philistines are running the city right now. There's no way. And so these three guys who are more than capable to get some water break through the Philistine lines, bring it back. And every time I read this story, I'm kind of, uh, I, for years, I've been very disappointed with David. <laughs> like, yeah. you just dump it out. Uh, I, and part of, the, part of the dumping it out is not just like, wow, oh, what a waste. But it really is like these guys risk their lives. And so this, is, this, this water is more valuable wow than any other water in the world. And so David in this prayer is pouring it out as a drink offering. He's saying, I'm, I, I'm not good enough for this water. And so he is giving it to the Lord as a drink offering. And so while it's, as we read it, it's like, wow, that's just so rude. <laughs> but David is in a way uh, is honoring them um, and we don't we don't get to read their reactions to this, but um, that's that's really the the essence of it is a uh, he's he's worshiping God and honoring them for their uh, their willingness to do this. I've never have had water that good um, that I would say, hey, would you would anybody would be willing to go and break through enemy lines for some water? Um, yeah, so it must be really good water. 
I, I hope to have some sometime. Uh, let's go to verse 18. Abishai, the brother of Joab, son of Zariah, was chief of the three. He raised his spear against 300 men whom he killed, and so he became as famous as the three. Was he not held in greater honor than the three? He became their commander, even though he was not included among them. So Abishai, if we remember, there's a season where Joab is no longer the general, and Abishai is brought over him, and then Joab's like, I'm going to take that back. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so that's part of this, but he uh, is another great warrior. Benaniah, son of Jehoiada, a valiant fighter from Kabziel, performed great exploits. He struck down Moab's two mightiest warriors. He also killed, uh, went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. And he struck down a huge Egyptian. Although the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, Benaniah went against him with a club. He snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Such were the exploits of Benaniah, son of Jehoiada. He too was as famous as the three mighty warriors. He was held in greater honor than, the, than any of the 30, but he was not included among the three. And David put him in charge of his bodyguard. And so um, one, of the, one of the first books that I read when I, I came on staff here uh, was by a man named Mark Batterson. And Batterson is a pastor in Washington, D.C., uh, and he's in our denomination, and that's one of the reasons why it was brought to my attention. And, and as Assemblies of God pastors, we um, it, it's not an, it's not very common to see a book from one of our pastors be so widely uh, publicized. And so it was one of those things where it's like, hey, this is one of us. Uh, and so I read it, and the book was called "In a Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day," and so it's focused on this story. Um, and you know, Batterson is a very raw, raw, get you pumped up kind of guy. And so his story, it, the, the message was like, look what you can do when it seems impossible. It basically is what Batterson took out of this. But every time I read through this, I have fond memories of Mark Batterson's book. Um, and it was really encouraging, but here, this, uh, this man, uh, Benaiah was, uh, he is unafraid is really the part of the message that we should take from him. He is unafraid. So he, he takes down the two mightiest warriors from Moab. He was willing to go into the pit on a snowy day. And people would uh, often trap lions in pits um, because you know lions are dangerous. And so they would build these traps and get them in a pit. Um, but uh, you know, the danger then is what if the lion was able to get out? And so in the pit, you would you would want somebody to eventually kill the lion just so that you remove the, the danger. Uh, but then also in a pit, you've got a confined space. <laughs> and so to go in there, you have to be brave uh, to be willing to do that. And so he went in on a snowy day. Snow, it was not impossible in uh, the region, but it's very rare. Um, and highlighting that it was snowy also shows that it's probably slippery. Uh, and so going in with a, a four-footed animal uh, and killing an, a, this ant lion on, on snowy terrain, it was risky, but he did it. Um, and then also um, fighting this uh, Egyptian, um, taking the spear from the Egyptian's hand. Like a spear is a weapon, you know, of distance. So he had to get close enough to get the spear and wrestle it free and then uh, kill the Egyptian with it. And so, I mean, this is a guy who has no fear and that's why he's included among this list. Um, and also why, like, this is a good dude to have as a bodyguard um, to say like, no, you're in charge of making sure that I'm safe because I want your no fearness to be trans transferred into all the people who are watching over the king. So um, and then we have this list here uh and i i'll go ahead and read it uh among the 30 were asahel brother of joab alahan uh, son of dodo from bethlehem shama the harodite alika the herodite helas the Pel haltite ira son of ikesh from tekoa ebiezer from anathoth sibakai the hushahite salmon the ahahite maharai the netophathite heled the son of Ba'ana, the Netophathite, Ithai, son of Rabbi from Gibeah in Benjamin, Benaiah, 
uh, the Pirathonite, Hedai from the ravines of Gash, Abi, Alban, the Arbathite, Osmaveth, the Barhamite, Eliaba, the Shalbanite, the son of Joshin, Jonathan, son of Shama, the Hararite, Ahayam, son of Sharar, the Hararite, Eph Elephilet, son of Abishai, Ahasabai, that's a, uh, that guy, Eliam, son of Ahithophel, the Gilanite, Hezro, the Carmelite, Parai, the Arbite, Igal, son of Nathan, from Zoba, the son of Hagar, Hagri, Zelek, the Ammonite, Zaharai, the Beerothite, of the armor bearer of Joab, son of Zariah, Ira, the Irtha, Ithrite, Garib, the Ithrite, and Uriah, the Hittite. There were 37 in all. So of this list, most of them are from Judah, which makes sense because David is from Judah. But there are others who are from Benjamin. Um, but the majority of these folks are from uh, David's own tribe. And, um, you know, that's one of the complaints that the other tribes had with David. We, we are 10 tribes. We should have 10 shares with David but David was heavily favoring the people of Judah, which, you know, which again, makes sense because they're his family. But at the same time, that's one of the tension points. Last among this list, Uriah the Hittite, one of David's mighty warriors, his 30, the, like the strong men. Um, the writer of 2 Samuel does not want us to forget that Uriah, was not just some guy. He was somebody that David knew, somebody that David trusted, and so his betrayal is even greater. Um, and so, yeah, and I, I do, I think it is significant that the, the writer of 2 Samuel made sure that Uriah was last. So that, like, as you're reading through this name, these names, and they sound weird to us, wouldn't have sounded weird to the original readers, um, but that Uriah was like, oh, I know that story. Um, and so while he has these mighty men, he was still not, not a great dude all the time. So chapter 24, we're almost there, guys. We're almost there. Uh, again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, go and take a census of Israel in, and Judah. So. What is this? The anger of the Lord burned against Israel and he incited David against them, telling him to do this thing. Why would God send David to go do a census because God was angry with David? This is one of the great mysteries of this book. Uh, and part of the trans uh, understanding is that um, maybe David did this because God was angry with him and he was trying to appease God and trying to say like, I'll do this so that God will be happy to see how big our army is maybe, or um, there are, there's an understanding of God's sovereignty over all of the spiritual forces in the world. Even King Saul had a tormenting spirit from the Lord. And so it, it was there something that David did that uh, in his life that upset the Lord. And so he sent a spirit like the spirit that was tormenting Saul so that David uh, would fall into, fall into folly and do something terrible so that David could have the opportunity to repent. Maybe. So this is a, this is a, a passage of scripture that has great tension in it. Um, and so my goal is not to resolve the tension as much as to say, yeah, you read that. I'm like, I don't know what's happening here. A lot of people have been arguing about this for a long time. <laughs> so you are not alone. So they're going to do a census, which is a count of all the, the military men. So the king said to Joab and the army commanders with him, go throughout the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and enroll the fighting men so that I may know how many there are. But Joab replied to the king, may the Lord your God multiply the troops a hundred times over and may the eyes of the Lord, the king, see it. But why does my Lord, the king, want to do such a thing? The king's word, however, overruled Joab and the army commanders. So they left the presence of the king to enroll the fighting men of Israel. 
So uh, some of the notes that I, I came across with this is that Joab here is pushing back against David on doing a census. And it doesn't really make sense. Like, well, why wouldn't the commander of the army want to know how many people are in the army? And so there, there are indications in other cultures in the ancient uh, Middle East there where um, they would look at counting the army as a sign of bad luck. And, uh, and so that might be part of like an old military superstition. Like you, don't, you want to have a good army, but you don't want to like boast about it. Because the only reason you're going to try to count the army is to boast. And so Joab's pushing back to say, hey, this is probably not a good idea. Um, and But David says, no, go and do it. Uh, verse 5, after crossing the Jordan, they camped near Aror, south of the town in the gorge, and then went through Gad and on to Jazer. Then they went to Gilead, the region of Tahim, Hadshi, and to Dan, John, and around uh, toward Sidon. Then they went toward the fortress of Tyre and all the towns of the Hivites and Canaanites. Finally, they went on to Beersheba in the Negev of Judah. Uh, part of the detail in this map, they're doing a big loop around the country to count all the people, but they're going into non-Israelite territory and they're counting fighting men that are not Israelites. And so even in the count, they are uh, exploiting others. And so the, the, the process here is not, um, is not good. And the writer is pointing this out for us. Like, the writer didn't have to tell us this, but he's pointing it out to say, look, the census was a bad idea, and the way they did it was a bad method. Um, so after they had gone through the entire land, they came back to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and 28 days. Joab reported the number of the fighting men to the king in Israel. There were 800,000 able-bodied men who could handle a sword. And in Judah, 500,000. David was conscious stricken after he had counted the fighting men. And he said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Now, Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. So now, too late, David, you already did the thing that you probably shouldn't have done. Um, but he recognizes that there, this was wrong. Now, it took him nine months to recognize it, uh, but he recognized it was wrong. So before David got up the next morning, the word of the Lord had come to Gad, the prophet, David's seer. Go and tell David, this is what the Lord says. I am giving you three options. Choose one of them for me to carry out against you. So Gad went to David and said to him, shall there come to you three years of famine in your land or three months of fleeing from your enemies while they pursue you or three days of plague in your land? Now then, Think it over and decide how I should answer the one who sent me. David said to Gad, I am in deep distress. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord for his mercy is great, but do not let me fall into human hands. So um, David, part of this is David knows what it is to run from people um, and they are not merciful. But he has also learned that the Lord the Lord's mercy is greater than David could ever imagine. David has received it time and again. And so he's willing to, he, does, he just doesn't want to be on the run from his enemies. Um, and so could be famine, could be plague, but he doesn't want to run from his enemies. So the Lord sent a plague on Israel from that morning until the end of the time designated. And 70,000 of the people from Dan to Beersheba died. So Dan to Beersheba again is north to south. So it's saying in the whole land, 70,000 people died. When the angel stretched out his hand to destroy Jerusalem, the Lord relented concerning the disaster and said to the angel who was afflicting the people, enough, withdraw your hand. The angel of the Lord was then at the threshing floor of Arunah the Jebusite. When David saw the angel who was striking down the people, he said to the Lord, I have sinned. I, the shepherd, have done wrong. These are but sheep. What have they done? Let your hand fall on me and my family. So the Lord relents at Jerusalem. And part of this is coming back to like, this is the city that, that God ultimately wants to make his dwelling place. And, and so we're going to see like how this comes about. But um, David is uh, recognizing his wrong again. And he's 
asking, Lord, let this come to my household instead of anybody else. Um, and so this is one of the contrasts between David and, and Saul. Saul was passing the blame. He was trying to please the people. He was not trying to bear the responsibility the way David is saying here. All of this is David's fault. And so he's, people have died because of David's foolishness. But now like he's trying to put an end to it and say, may the rest come to me. Um, verse 18. On that day, Gad went to David and said to him, go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. So David went up as the Lord had commanded through Gad. When Aruna looked and saw the king and his officials coming toward him, he went out and bowed down before the king with his face to the ground. Aruna said, why has my Lord, the king, come to his servant? To buy your threshing floor, David answered, so I can build an altar to the Lord, that the plague of the, on the people may be stopped. Aruna said to David, let my Lord, the king, take whatever he wishes and offer it up. Here are oxen on, of the burnt offering, and here are the threshing sledges and ox yokes for the wood. Your majesty, Orana, gives all this to the king. Orana also said to him, may the Lord your God accept you. But the king replied to Orana, no, I insist on paying for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord, my God, burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen and paid 50 shekels of silver for them. David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then the Lord answered his prayer in behalf of the, of the land and the plague on Israel was stopped. So David goes to buy, he's directed by Gad to go and buy the, the threshing floor where the angel is just there. And I love, I don't know if anybody else could see the angel. Arona seems to not really notice like he's out there doing work and he sees the king coming, doesn't see this angel hanging out, like just not killing people. Um, and, uh, but he comes up and, and David's like, I need to buy this. And this land would have been up on the hill because the threshing floor, uh, threshing wheat required wind. And so you would uh, like scoop with like a pitchfork, the, the wheat, um, and you would lift it up. And the wheat kernels that you want to keep are heavier than the chaff. And so the chaff would fly away and the wheat would fall down. Um, and so this was a, a big space and it would have been up on a hill. And, um, and so maybe one of the highest points in the land. Um, and so that's why David probably could see the angel uh, pretty well. And so he goes there and he wants to buy it. And Aruna is so generous. Like, no, take it. You're the king. I trust you, David. <laughs> Which is like, why? Um, and, uh, and so, but David is being tempted here to take the easy way he just wants to give it to me i'll take it look at this guy being so generous i'll take it but david insists on paying for it um and he got a really good deal 50 shekels of silver compared to abraham buying the cave by the trees of Mamre, uh, he paid 400 shekels of silver. Uh, so David got a screaming deal on this, uh, this hilltop. Um, but he buys the, 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 the threshing floor and he builds an altar there and he makes a sacrifice. And this altar that he built was probably a stone altar that uh, was arranged and um, with like unhewn stone. So it wasn't anything pretty, um, but the sacrifice there was, the, the, the cow that was burnt up entirely to the Lord as a sin offering. Now, this place, the threshing floor of Arunah, is going to be the place where the temple will be built. And so David buys this. And earlier, remember, he wanted to build a temple for the Lord. And the Lord said, uh, no. You're not going to do it. Your descendants will do it. So David continued, though, to build a stockpile of resources that would eventually go to the temple. And now here, towards the end of his life, as Samuel's maybe telling us, it could have been earlier, we don't really know, um, he has secured the land. And this is the end of the scroll of Samuel, is David securing the land. And as we walk through like the history of the 
the people of Israel, we see uh, again and again, um, thank you, um, that the Lord, okay. Were you the man who last Christmas Eve at Creekside Church said Christmas lights are a representation of the Christ? Was that you or a different speaker? It might have been me, yeah. That was great. I okay, it, and I thanks. I that church is Jesus Christ of Saturday Faith too, and I wrote it in my notes. So. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. All right, Linda, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. All right. Well, be safe, okay? All right. Um, yes, indeed. Thank you. Um, so all, all that David is building here uh, is a, uh, he's setting up the next generation. But when we walk through the history of the people of Israel, securing the land is an important thing. And so D Abraham secured the land through uh, for his descendants by purchasing a grave. Uh, and now David is securing the land to build the temple uh, by purchasing a threshing floor. Um, and the first thing that is done there is a sacrifice. And the temple is going to be the centerpiece for the worship of the uh, for the people of Israel. Uh, for generations to come. And it's going to be a place where sacrifices are made over and over and over again. And David was the first one to sacrifice there. So that's where we're going to wrap up. Um, any questions on uh, Samuel, 2 Samuel 22 through 24? There's a lot of names. There's a lot of poetry. There's a lot. Um, so any questions? Yeah. When we, when he, he talks about it, um, according to my righteousness, where I've done nothing wrong, right. sin. Like you said earlier, though, we don't know when these are from. So, was this, could this have been early in his anointing of yeah. Daniel? So, yeah, it could be before anything happened with Bathsheba. Yeah. It could have been. Um, but we and, and part of it is like the Lord delivered me from the hand of all my enemies and from the hand of Saul. So that hand of Saul reference could be saying like, look, I'm becoming king now. So it could be written at that point for sure. Uh, it's a for sure possibility. <laughs> so um, the, the question, though, is why is it included at the end? That's that's really the question that I that I am wrestling with is like the the person who created or compiled second samuel and it probably wasn't called second samuel for them but uh the the person who compiled this scroll includes this story here after we have read all of this stuff about david um and so there is a um there is the hand of a uh you know the, the inspiration of the spirit but also a, a human editor who is putting these these last few chapters uh, at this point. Uh, and so why are they doing it that way? Um, and I think one of the things for us to remember is, yes, David was God's chosen king. He was a man after God's own heart. He was the one who the Lord chose. Um, and it would be very easy to want to kind of just minimize all the other stuff that david did and you know we see in the book of chronicles there's uh most of chronicles is just following the the good things that the kings of judah did and leaving out even the bad things that the kings of judah did I'm trying to minimize those samuel and first and second kings are giving us like the the like the real dirt <laughs> like these people are a mess um and so these stories here at the end of second samuel i think are included to, to help us Keep David human to remind us, like, well, he was good. He did a lot of great things. He unified our country, but he was also a mess. He was deeply flawed. And we need to remember that. And so looking at his, if this psalm was written early, looking at his early ascendancy, and then contrast this with 24, and if this is towards the end of his leadership then we also are, are reminded like but he was still doing dumb things <laughs> but even when he was doing dumb things 
he still managed to b- buy the place where the temple is going to be built. And so like just a really complicated person. <laughs> and, um, and he's not just the guy that we, uh, you know, we know the stories of the shepherd and killing the bear and the lion in my hands, killing David and Goli- the story of David and Goliath and like trying not killing Saul and all these things that he did that were like, wow, what a good, what a good dude. But then also gets a little bit of power, gets a little bit of comfort and he regresses into selfishness. Uh, just like what is common with so many. Um, and even us, like when we get power and we get comfortable, it's easy to take advantage of that. And we need to be mindful. Like we are not better than David. And David is not better than us. Um, and so what we need is a more perfect David. And that's one of the messages that we read as we read through the kings. We're going to see none of these kings ever really live up to David. Even Solomon didn't really live up to David. And and so disappointment after disappointment after disappointment, and then a good one, and then a disappointment, and back and forth. We need a better David. We need a better king. And as we uh, read through the prophets, there's messages of the prophets talking about the divine king that will come. And, you know, in the time, they'll probably think, well, it's whoever the son of the king is. Maybe it's the next one. Now, <laughs> the prophet was also looking farther to the future in a way that the Lord inspired to say, like, no, there's a king coming that will not disappoint. And we f- find that ultimately fulfilled in Jesus, the son of David, the son of God. Yeah, so, yeah, but good, but good observation, Kevin. Like, it could have been early but we don't know. <laughs> we don't know, but it's included here, which is the really frustrating part of the whole thing. <laughs> so like, I wish they would just date things. Um, so like I, all of my notes, like, you can't see this, but I, my, my title for every file that I write starts with year, month, day, <laughs> so that I can, I can search it quickly. Um, I wish they would do stuff like that. I, I, if I had a time machine, I'd just go back and say, all right, guys, I got to write down some days. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, from where I'm at, you're in 10,000 BC. Work with that um, or whatever. So <laughs> um, that's probably not the best way to use a time machine. <laughs> so <laughs> all right. Any other thoughts or questions? David had the plan that that would be the temple site. If he was collecting other things, was he already thinking this will be that for that site? You know, I can't answer that with what the text says because the text does not indicate uh, the the reason he buys it is because the Lord tells him to. So, um, sorry, I closed my Bible. Um, the angel stops there. And the Lord speaks through Gad to go and build an altar there on the threshing floor of Aruna. And so, um, yeah, the Lord stopping there was ultimately the, the determiner that that's where I need to do this altar. So, um, yeah, this is all part of God's plan more than David's plan. So, I mean, it, what's amazing, um, is how important that site is for the world, even now. Yeah. Like the yeah. Temple Mount has been fought over. Three religions hold it. <laughs> yes. Three major religions in the world revere this place, and it is occupied uh, by uh, a, a mosque right now, the Dome of the Rock. And the the significance of this place and the significance of the land of Israel itself is really overwhelming when it's like, it's just so small. <laughs> it's so small, but it's so important um, for, for so long. Uh, and so, yeah, but this was God's chosen place. And so thinking about what that place, the significance of the temple, uh, when we read about the, in the Kings, when they're like letting the temple, like go to ruin at different points. And, and then like they have the revival comes when they're like, no, we need to take care of, care of the temple, clean it up. 
make it better. <laughs> why are we not revering what God has blessed us with? Why, like, why are we not treating it with reverence and, and respect? Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's the history here is, is these historical books. I, I, I love them. They're so much fun. <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, great stuff. So yeah, Michael, you had a question? Yeah. 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 So uh, for the folks online, Michael was pointing out that keeping Uriah at the end is a reminder of the relationship here and that this adulterous act that David uh, committed was with, with a known person. And you can't be betrayed by an enemy. Something that uh, my father-in-law uh, would say often. And, he, you know, he, he's, he was the pastor of Creekside for years before I was the lead pastor. And, um, you know, there are times in churches and in, in relationships where people turn on you. And it, it's, if it's people that you don't have a relationship with, it doesn't hurt as much. Because it's like, well, sometimes people just are mad. And they do things. But when it's your friend, somebody you trust, who betrays you, I mean, that, that hurts deep. And so Uriah was betrayed by David. But Jesus was betrayed by Judas. Jesus knew Judas. They spent three years together. Like they were friends. You know? And so that act of betrayal, I mean, it's a, a good reminder, Michael, like those you can only be betrayed by your friends. And um, yeah, which is hard, but it's, a, it's, a, it's part of the human story of David that he is far from perfect. So any, any questions from our online crew of folks? No? All right. Well, you all have a blessed day blessed week the rain is coming the smoke will go away um and uh yeah it's good news um and we uh will not be together next week remember so um don't try to log into zoom don't try to come down the ramp into these this room the door will be locked if you want to go to youth group that's just weird so um at this point it's just weird uh so uh yeah so we'll take this next week off and we'll be back the first wednesday in uh, November. So God bless. And we will see you all later. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Jason. Thank you. Oh, good night. Bye.